Notebook 14 In the Blood-Soaked Mud of the Somme From the 1st of November, 1916 to the 30th of January, 1917 Part 2 Last time we left as Barthes and the other Poilus returned from their latest stay in the trenches of the Somme where they had suffered miserably with over five days of non-stop rain and snowstorms. They spent the night sleeping in large tents in the town of Hardecourt, and we shall see what happened there. Two days after their arrival, the Poilus received news that all French units were being relieved from that sector by the British. Barthes and the others got onto trucks, and were eventually dropped off at the town of Salué, four kilometers from the city of Amiens. Barthes wrote that the town was more like a populous suburb of Amiens, and it blended together with two other villages. The population itself was generous, and the police could supply themselves with all kinds of products. To the soldiers' great joy, they also got clean billets, a luxury they were not used to. When they arrived there, it was announced that 40% of the Palouse would go on home leave that very night. There was an explosion of joy, and even the ones that weren't going were happy, as their turn would come soon. Barthas wrote that with these happy news, they forgot about all the misery and dangers they had faced in the trenches. No one gave a second thought to the dead they had left behind. This time, the regiment had not attacked, and so they had not had such high losses. Still, Barthas wrote that even in the quietest sectors shells claimed victims every day, and he mentioned some tragic incidents that had happened during their trench duty. One of these incidents was in Barthas's old 21st company, the one he had served in under Captain Houdel. There, his old active duty Sergeant Darl was suddenly killed by a shell, the sergeant's brother was a private in that same unit, and he rushed to Darl's aid. But another shell killed him moments later. Barthas wrote that it would still have been the same tragedy if it had been two brothers, two friends, or two strangers, but that one could only imagine the terrible suffering of a father and a mother when they suddenly learned that their two sons, their joy and hope for the future, had been killed. Barthas wrote that if someone talked to these poor old people about glory, victory and the fatherland, they would simply ask that they did not insult their misery. Elsewhere, on the 23rd company, the company Barthas had been sent to when he had been demoted, his old comrade Escand was also killed. A shell fragment had torn a hole in his thigh and he bled out. Barthas wrote that Escand had been a good socialist militant back when that meant something, and he lamented how many worthy militants he saw cut down by the war, as if it had taken vengeance on those who had hated it the most. In the 23rd company, another man, originally from Periac Minerva, was also killed. His name had been Francois Petit. As kids, Barthas and Francois had been neighbors, they had gone to the same school and had played together. Then, when he was twelve, Francois went with his father to South America. He stayed there for thirty years and returned when the war was declared. Francois himself had not been a fervent patriot, but he thought that the war would allow him to return to France at no cost, and that due to his forty years of age he wouldn't be sent to the front lines. But... Despite his age, he was assigned to a fighting unit in the 23rd Company, his name right next to Barthas on the roster. Before his last home leave, Francois told Barthas that he intended to cross the frontier to Spain and return to South America, where people were not afflicted with a war madness. But twelve days later he returned, not having the courage to carry out his escape. A week later... During a Russian detail, Francois, together with four of his comrades, were killed by a sudden barrage. 
Barthes wrote that it would have been better if Francois had stayed in the Argentine Republic. No one thought of him now, and his name did not even appear on the monument that was erected at Periac for all those who died in the war. For Barthes himself, that monument, and its inscription which read, For those of its children who died for France, were nothing but the highest hypocrisy. Some days later, on the 4th of December, there was another tragedy, as a corporal called Muller, a Parisian, whom Barthes described as steep in all vices, a pervert, and a lover of cocaine, killed a 15-year-old girl. The girl's father was fighting on the front, and her grandmother ran a tavern. Barthes could only speculate at how enraged the newspapers would have been if the murder had been committed by a German, how they wouldn't have had enough words in the dictionary to describe such brutal barbarism. But, since the murder was committed by a Frenchman, it was all suppressed and covered up. Many soldiers in the regiment did not even know what happened, and Barthes only knew because Lieutenant Loriou, who knew that Barthes was writing a record of their suffering in the war, told him. It had happened like this. It had been evening at the tavern run by the girl's grandmother. The drunk, Corporal Muller, had been waving his revolver around and then pointed it at the girl. Say I dare you, he demanded. The girl thought it was a game and smiling said, I dare you. Then the corporal pulled the trigger. He later swore he thought the gun was unloaded, but that didn't change what happened. A bullet went out and tore through the girl's neck artery. Without a sound, she fell dead. Barthes wrote that one could only imagine the emotions which were roused in the town by this crime. The corporal was arrested immediately and taken before a court-martial. But the victim's family had the generosity of intervening on his behalf, and so Müller was sentenced to only two years in prison. Still, the consequences of this terrible event did not stop there. The two thousand men of the regiment were treated as if they were responsible for the actions of one criminal, and so, on the 6th of December, and with much regret, the police had to leave behind comfortable salueurs and marched twelve kilometers in the cold to set up camp in Brigmenil, a tiny village devoid of all comforts. The only witnesses to their arrival were an old peasant, three youngsters, and a dozen geese. The village was built around a stinking pond. There was no tavern to rest in, only a small grocery store run by an ill-tempered gossip. The town's well was ninety meters deep. To bring up some of its whitish water required a hundred and fifty turns of the handle, which was a two-man operation. Early in the morning, the regiment's cooks grouped around the well to get water, to the anger of all the inhabitants, who said it would soon dry up and they would be forced to buy water from the neighboring villages. Barthes's company was housed in the upper floors of a large barn. To reach it, one had to climb up a ladder which barely reached the hole that served as a window, and then pull oneself by sheer arm strength. Barthes wrote that this was a game for the younger members of the company, but for those like himself who were nearing forty, it was very dangerous. The first time he tried to climb up, he almost fell headfirst into the paving stones below, and so he decided to find some other place to sleep. After some searching around, Barthes found some pig pens which had been deemed to be uninhabitable for pigs, but he quickly claimed the least dilapidated of them. He was lucky, as a few minutes later all the others were taken by storm by other paloos. Barthes wrote how they were all reduced to the state of arguing with each other over half-demolished pig pens. The war was turning them into little more than beasts, but still they felt very lucky for simply being sheltered from the rain and away from the dangers of the trenches. Barthes wrote that they had a long stay there 
and he slowly turned that pig pen into his home. He filled the holes on the walls with papers. He closed up the rat holes with broken glass. With a few bricks and straw he made his bed, and a plank on the wall was his dresser. His knapsack became his pillow, desk, and briefcase, and for lightning he turned an English grenade into a kerosene lamp. And so they spent their days. Occasionally, in the evenings, the police would head out to a village called Bourganville. The trip was a total of eight kilometers at night in the middle of winter, but it allowed them to get provisions and sit for a while in a warm and well-lit café, as a small comfort and reminder of home. The day after their arrival at the village, as if to punish them for the girl's murder, the training exercises started again despite the cold and rain. At one point, the lieutenant and the three sergeants of Barthas's gun group left on home leave, and Barthas was put in command of it. It was an assignment with far more disadvantages than benefits, and he cursed it. He wrote how, at the end of July 1914, when he was peacefully working at his simple barrel maker's workshop, it would never have crossed his mind that one day he would be commanding a group of field guns and their gunners. This produced no pride for him. Then Christmas came. The only difference with the other days was that the Palouse did not have to train. That same day, the newspapers announced in huge letters a peace proposal from Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany. Barthas wrote that this gave the soldiers a flash of hope that was quickly snuffed out. Their country's leaders spoke through the newspapers of how this peace offer indicated that the Germans were running out of food, money, men and ammunition, and that no negotiations should be carried out, but that instead they should unleash a supreme effort to defeat their exhausted foe. Barthas wrote that Germany would show through its resistance for two more years that it still had the means to wage war, and that their leaders had lied. He wrote that he detested the Kaiser and all the brutal authoritarianism and militarism he represented, but that at least he had made a gesture of peace, and that by refusing to even consider it and continuing the bloodshed, their leaders had assumed an enormous responsibility before history. Later, by the end of December, the Poulouse learned that their regiment would be moved from the Ninth Corps to the Eighth. This left them completely indifferent. Out of every twenty men, nineteen did not even know what corps they belonged to. Still, their superiors considered that this was a momentous event, and so they had to carry out a farewell ceremony on the 6th of January. The ceremony involved parading and standing for three hours in the freezing cold in some fields a few kilometers away from the town. The division's general gave a great speech, exalting the virtues of the regiment, how it was now a well-tempered tool of war, and how it brought tears into his eyes to see them leave. Barthas wrote that the Palouse had suffered far more and more heartbreaking separations for them to be moved by this one. The next day, January 7th, 1917, the regiment left Brick Menil to join their new corps, and, after marching all day, arrived at night at a village called Morvillet. This new town was about as attractive as the one they had left, consisting of only three hamlets and a church in the middle of the fields. As a billet, Barthas's group received a filthy barn with earthen walls full of holes. One of the holes was so large that a man could easily climb through it, and the freezing winds and rain easily entered the building. The Poulouse mattress was a platform that might as well have been a pile of manure, which in all likelihood contained legions of lice. Martha's old pig pen had been a palace compared to this, and he went out to look for some other isolated place where he could rest. All the stables pig pens and dog houses were occupied by their respective animals, but eventually he found a building near a filthy pond that was being used as a storeroom. The ground was muddy and the walls damp, 
but he took residence there together with his friend Vidal, a man from Carcassonne who had lived in Periac Minerva for a while. To make this new billet inhabitable, the thing they needed at all cost was some straw. They went out to search and had great difficulties, but eventually found a wagon used to transport livestock with a good pile of straw. They immediately stole it and made themselves at home in the storeroom. Barthas wrote that it was very nice to be away from the crowded encampment, with all its snoring, belching, rude songs, arguments between card players and mutterings of drunks. It allowed him to escape for a moment the sad reality they were living through. During their stay there, the men would go out to the neighboring town of Omal, where there were shops and cafes of all kinds. In vain, their superiors announced every day at roll call that entry into the town was forbidden without explicit authorization. The Palus laughed at this. On Sundays, when Barthas went to the town with his comrades, they would number over a thousand men, and they would swarm Omal Street with their 296th regiment patches proudly showing on their greatcoats. The gendarmes at the town's entrances were powerless before these invasions, and wisely stood to the side and did nothing. If they had tried to arrest a Poilu, particularly during night time, they would have been beaten mercilessly. Barthas wrote that so were things with a fighting soldier, who felt pity for the German who suffered just like him, but who hated the gendarme, the slacker of the rear who tried to bother him and spoil his precious free time the moment he was out of the trenches. And so was life in that village. On the 13th of January, the Poulous had to take part in a military review of the division, marching and standing for hours in 15 centimeters of muddy snow and freezing cold. For their military chiefs, the suffering of thousands of men meant nothing before their rules and traditions. Then, on January 16th, Barthas was at last granted his home leave, and he left at five in the morning together with some comrades to catch the train at the town of Omal. The train was supposed to pass at 7 a.m., but as usual with the leave-taker trains, it was behind schedule. The station was overflowing with leave-takers, and so Barthas and his comrades had to stay outside and occasionally carry out calisthenic exercises to keep warm. On the station platform, there was a pile of merchandise. It turned out that one of the boxes had split open. An indiscreet Poilu reached inside with his hand and pulled out a bottle of rum. This produced a frenzy as the Poilus rushed towards the box. Moments later, it was empty. Barthas wrote that war destroyed in men, who in uniform became anonymous, all sense of honesty. When killing was treated as a virtue, then stealing became a simple peccadillo. Finally, at 9 a.m. the train arrived. By 10 a.m. the police were at the station of the city of Beauvais, where they had to wait for a long while. By 9 p.m. they had reached the Surveillet switching station, but due to the congestion of the rail lines in nearby Paris, it took them many hours to pass the city. They reached Orléans at 1 a.m., long after the next train they were supposed to take, the one to Toulouse. This would mean long hours of waiting in the Baron station, but the police discovered that an express train to Bordeaux was about to leave, and they quickly climbed onto it. A detour of two or three hundred kilometers meant little to them. They were traveling for free, and it was better than staying in the uncomfortable station. To their misfortune, however, with the war there was shortage of glass, so on the trains many windows had only their frames. Barthas wrote that when one was granted home leave, it was like a madness took hold over you, and you did not care about all the discomforts you faced on the way there. Still, it was a difficult ride, as the temperature was several degrees below zero, and the wind blew easily into the train cars. 
the cars were not heated in order to save coal, so the shivering paloos had to pile together in the corners of the cars, and they almost froze to death that night. But, at last, with great joy, they stepped on to the Bordeaux station at eight in the morning, under a warm sun. Twelve hours later, Barthes entered his home at Pairiac Minerva and was greeted by his loved ones. Barthes commented that he found the spirits in the village greatly changed. With disaster in Romania, the sending of large numbers of troops to Salonica, the call-up of the conscript class of 1918, the large numbers of those that had evaded recruitment, and the shortages of sugar, coal and transport, had turned the original great optimism into a deep pessimism, as people began to see the reality of war. Barthes wrote that, unfortunately, the seven days of his leave passed very quickly, and on the 28th of January he had to begin his journey back to the front. But he learned from his friends that the regiment had left the Somme, and was now installed on the trenches at the border of Champagne and the Argonne. Barthes figured that by changing his route slightly, he could spend one more day with his family, and did so. He wrote that those who might read his notes would think that that was silly. It was only one day after all. But for he and his family, those few extra hours and minutes were beyond precious. Then Barthes went on his way. As they crossed the countryside by train in the night, the temperature plummeted. The land was covered with snow, and frost covered the train's windows. For the Poulouse, this weather indicated that the Argonne trenches would not be very nice. After some time, they passed through the town of Sand. There, they saw firemen putting out a fire in a station building, which had been started by an air bombardment that had just taken place. The structure had been reduced to rubble. There were four dead, and a scared crowd surrounded the scene. But, from the train, the soldiers looked indifferently at all of this. They were no longer moved by the sight of ruins, fire, and death. Eventually, at three in the morning, the cold and hungry Poulouse stopped at the station of the small town of Valmy. This was where Barthes had to get off. To receive the arriving leave-takers, there was a barracks. It was freezing cold despite a small stove which had been placed in the middle. Twenty soldiers were gathered around that stove, vainly trying to get some warmth out of it. Barthes tried to lie down on a bench, but the cold made it impossible, and he had to pace back and forth in the barracks until morning. At dawn, the Poulouse were given a warm drink of what was allegedly coffee. Then, each man left to join his own unit together with the ration squads. As they left, Barthes passed through Valmy, and he looked around with great interest. The town was historic, due to it being the place of the legendary Battle of Valmy of 1792, which was the first victory of the new French government after the French Revolution. The battle had stopped an invading Prussian army, and so it had deeply changed the fate of France, Europe, and the world. Barthes wrote that it had been but an insignificant skirmish compared to the war they were fighting now. During that battle, a windmill had figured prominently. Barthes looked around for it, but was told that it had been a long time since any grain had been milled from it. Not a single stone of the legendary building remained, only a small sign saying where it had once stood. Barthes was also shocked by the land. With the paintings and accounts he had seen before, he had supposed that Valmy stood before a gorge, where the Prussian army was stopped like a torrent before it spread into the plains of France beyond. But the land was flat and ordinary, with but the occasional small elevation. Martha stopped at the top of one of the small hills and looked at the land around him. Everything was covered in snow. 
The roads were practically deserted, and only occasionally in the distance one could hear cannon fire. This was a calm sector, completely different from the Somme and its roads flooded with all kinds of vehicles and troops going to and from the front. Seven kilometers later, the police reached a half-demolished village called domartin sur A few tenacious inhabitants remained here despite the shells that frequently fell on the town. Here, Barthas had the pleasure of finding the drivers and crew of a 37mm cannon resting in an intact house which had tables, chairs, mirrors and all kinds of furniture. Each soldier could sleep on a bed or a mattress. They were like royalty there. Barthas discovered that his own team would arrive at that home the next day for their six-day rest. He only had to wait for them. That same evening, the Plus were eating around a big fire when four explosions shook the house. Then there was the noise of broken tiles. It took them a moment to figure out what was going on and they immediately ran for the basement. But that was all. One of the shells had fallen on a nearby house where the food stores were located, but it only damaged a row of sausages. A second shell had fallen right in front of their home, in a pen where about twenty of their horses and mules were located. Three of the animals were lying on the ground. One of them had been decapitated, while the other two were in agony. As a mercy, someone finished them off with a pistol. Later, the police fat and always hungry comrade Frazé was very happy when he heard of the nice cuts of horse meat the man would enjoy for the next few days. And so, we now reach the end of the 14th notebook. After the terrible ordeal of the Somme, the police are now serving in a quiet sector between Champagne and the Argonne. Still, here one is quickly reminded that even in the calmest sectors shells claim victims. We shall see how Barthes' story continues on the next episode. For now, I hope you've enjoyed this video, and I'll see you next time.